I remember that, I think it was, I would say it's one of my siblings, maybe it was me. The first time I heard a four letter word that starts with F spoken at my parents, it is not fair. That word was not allowed in my home. Because when kids say something's not fair, what they're talking about is things are not going according to their expectations and their wants. Oh, my parents did not like it when we said something was not fair. Oh, you think that's not fair? You know, you know how much we're doing for you, etc. <laughs> I didn't pay attention after that point anyways. Uh, we do the same to our God. We have certain expectations and wants of God, and we lose it. We, we, we really lose control, we really lose a sense of, of, of peace when things aren't according to our expectations and wants. That plays out in a couple ways in today's readings. The first is with uh, Moses. The Lord has ordained a specific day for a select number of men to come forward to the the meeting tent and there the, the cloud from God would descend upon them and they were to receive the gift of prophecy now two of them didn't show up so as the cloud descends these men receive the gift of prophecy and uh, which you know when the scriptures speak of prophecy it's what it's the ability to they were speaking into people's lives were they were they foretelling what the Lord was going to do were they just proclaiming the truth with clarity what exactly the prophecy was it an ecstatic form of prayer not not totally sure but we know that it was a clear gift from the Lord something that was of God so they discover that there are two men who didn't show up who also are now found prophesying in their camp, wherever they stayed. And basically, imagine, what were the men thinking, the ones who went out of their way to the frightening place that many had feared and trembled at the sight of the Shekinah, the cloud from the Lord. And they were brave, they, they swallowed their fears and they showed up. I mean, who knows if they was, there was some preparation process as well. I mean, for, for priests and seminarians, I went through seven years of studies and, and grueling time of living in intense um, supervision, if you will, and being corrected and improving my behaviors, etc., in addition to the academic stuff. And imagine if, if, if I came up here and I find out some guy got ordained without, you know, he spent like one year in seminary, I'd be like, come on! That's not fair! And that's just a little bit of a sense of what perhaps those men were thinking. These two guys are prophesying? Now, maybe it wasn't just not fair. Maybe it's also like, hey, that's, that can't be good. Because they weren't here. That can't be out of God. That must be evil. Again, what was prophecy? You know, it's, it must have been some, it was something that was clearly of God. It wasn't just foretelling the future. And what is Moses' reply? I mean, because they're telling him, stop them. And he says, are you jealous on my behalf? And he says, would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. The men had certain expectations. They expected things to go a certain way. And they wanted to be the, the honored ones or whatever. Or they didn't, want, uh, they didn't want things to get confusing to the people. Moses, what did he want? He was conv he, his expectation is God is almighty and good. And his desire was that everyone would experience that and come to know it. In the gospel today, there's a, the apostles, disciples following Jesus, and they find out that someone who's not one of the disciples is casting out demons. And they're like, Jesus, you, you, we, we tried to stop him and he wouldn't. You, you got to stop him. First of all, if there are people who are possessed and they're being delivered, are, like, praise the Lord. <laughs> isn't that a great good? And they're like, but no, th this isn't the way we expect it to be. It's not right. They, they should, it can't be of God because they're not followers of Jesus. And he said, If they're not against us, 
They're for us. No one can do signs and wonders in my name if it's not with God's grace. See, one of the temptations for us as Americans in particular is we, uh, we like order, structure. Um, and and if, you ever, if you've ever gone to Europe or in Mexico, Latin America, when you go to communion at Mass, people don't form lines. Somebody knows. They, I mean, it's just pure chaos. People just approach the altar. And it's kind of beautiful because you get the sense that, hey, people will go once they're ready. Everyone goes at their own pace. <laughs> but it's just a mob of people coming at the... There isn't this pew first and that pew. There's no ushers telling you what to do. And if they are, they're outside probably just, you know. But <laughs> we, we like order. We like litigation. We take people to court. When things are not right, when things are not fair, we hash it out in court. We have expectations that things are going to be fair. Jesus did not win the salvation of souls through litigation. The apostles did not bring about thousands and thousands of conversions in courthouses. St. Paul says, I did not come with eloquent words, but with power and manifestations of the Spirit. Then people say, well, oh, Father, you know, that, that, that holy stuff, that's for you priests. I mean, look at you guys. You're, you're so holy. You just love to pray. I'm not like that. I'm a normal person. <laughs> Have you put limits on our God out of your own fears or insecurities, out of your vanity and pride? There's a paragraph in the, in the Catechism of the Church that says, God has bound salvation to the sacraments. So this is an important paragraph because it's absolutely true that God has ordained things to be a certain way. He has given us the church. It's the one true church. There's no other church that has the true body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ present. There's no other church that has guaranteed uh, um, authority from the Holy Spirit in the hierarchy. But the paragraph says, oh, and, and also, furthermore, the church says that there is no salvation without baptism. Ba God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism. Gosh, that sounds pretty harsh. But the paragraph continues, and I think this is paragraph 2157. I've had to look it up many times for many reasons. But the paragraph says that God has bound limited salvation to the sacraments, but God is not bound by the sacraments. There's a temptation in us to feel like we've got to litigate, f fight, and figure this out. And there's a, there's a temptation to lose hope when we see so many people leaving the church and when we see how corrupt the world is. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, well, Father, do, don't you know that, like, there's evil stuff going on in the government? Haven't you heard that there are prophecies that, you know, nations will rise and have all this power and it's going to bring about great destruction? I'm like, yeah. In fact, that's the one thing that the scriptures promised us, that Jesus himself said, you will be persecuted for following me and you will be taken to court and be taken to death. <laughs> it's the one promise he made. <laughs> Our hope is not here, guys. Our hope is not in litigation. Otherwise, it's not, it's, it's not Christian hope unless it's hope that we can get to heaven, union with him. God has given us structures. He's given us the church. But he is not bound by them. Our God is unbound. What does that mean? I mean, for, for one, think of how, how painful it is when family members or your own children leave the church or start questioning. It can cause such pain and panic. And when you start panicking and you, you tell your kids, you're crazy, don't, don't, you're, ah, that helps them so much. <laughs> when, 
But we panic because we, have, we had certain expectations. We thought it was going to play out a certain way. Whereas we ought to move from a, an attitude of expectations to expectancy. And here's how I'm going to distinguish those words. Expectancy is to expect that, to know God is working always, everywhere, in every heart. I'm looking for the signs of it. When you see the good in those who are fallen, and you call it out, and you, you praise God for it, it starts to do something to you. You know, when you tell someone who's away, hey, I notice you have this particular gift, and that's, that's really the kind of gift that comes from God. I just want to appreciate that, and, and I, I glorify God that you, you have that gift. I think it's beautiful. You know what that does to people? It opens them up. And maybe even one day they'll listen. But you, but you have to... You have to be expectant. God's at work. Uh, the same thing happens in, in the world and everything around us. We tend to freak out when our expectations or our hopes or our wants of this world aren't coming as we thought. And we panic. We end up in anxiety. One of the things that happens when a person is anxious, their breathing becomes shallow. You don't breathe full breaths. And what's interesting about that is when you're breathing shallow, you, you actually build up toxins in your bloodstream. I don't actually know what that means, but let me say some more about that. <laughs> I know that the breathing process is that there are 14.6 pounds of atmospheric pressure, at least at sea level, pressing upon us at all times. And so there's no fan in your body that sucks in air, but rather your diaphragm lowers creating more space beneath your lungs. And as soon as the, sp the lungs have space to expand, <sighs> those 14.6 pounds of atmospheric pressure have room to fill in more. So, when you breathe deeply, your lungs have uh, all these cell lines, I mean, these, uh, the cell walls, again, uh, words I don't know what they mean, but they kind of clean the air that you breathe, they separate the good from the bad, you know, oxygen from carbon dioxide, but they also um, have a system in taking toxins out of your bloodstream so that you can exhale them. Certain, certain toxins are released through your exhaling. But when you're breathing shallow, your lungs don't have the space or the time to do that process. Toxins build up, your muscles tense, uh, etc. It gets worse and worse. Your brain gets cloudy. Our God is pressing upon us at all time. Our God is never passive. He never folds his arms and say, well, let's see what happens now. <laughs> he is active. He is pure act. He can't do anything but pour his grace upon us. And Jesus himself said, he lets the rain fall on the good and the bad. The sun shines on evil and good. 14.6 pounds of atmospheric pressure. What must we do? And we must. We have a duty to make space. The liturgy is one of these beautiful gifts that we've received from Jesus, where we have a lot of silence, common gestures, sitting, standing, listening, responding. It's a unique space. We're here to celebrate the great glory that is our God's presence coming, a ton of, coming upon us in, in something greater than just a cloud, but rather Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity, in a way that we can receive. So we enter into that mystery to celebrate it, but also with the sense of reverence. Reverence is the awareness that there's more going on than I'm aware of. The awareness that there's more going on than I'm aware of. That's reverence. It's a posture of expectancy. What's God going to say to me? Where's God calling me? Brothers and sisters, it's not just the priests who are called to serve. We have a specific ministerial role. But don't let the evil one trick you into thinking that you're not called to proclaim the faith. That you're not called to console the broken. 
that you're not called to, to minister to those in need, to help the poor, to engage those who are confused of mind. People think that I just know things about the faith. I mean, I spent, yes, yeah, seven years in seminary preparing for this, but that was just to give me the tools so I can keep studying. I have to stay abreast. I have to, if I'm not praying with the scriptures every day, then I'm going to run out of things to say. Or worse, I'm going to say things that I don't really receive and believe. That's an ongoing process, by the way, please. That's why we ask you to pray for priests. Um, but the Lord works in whatever way he wants. Let's enter into that spirit of expectancy and ask him to help us increase in the gift of faith, hope, and charity. So that even we can be prophets in the world that needs it.